Okay, thank you, and good morning. So uh, there's a list of my co-authors and their institutes. You can work out which is which. So I thought that we would have seen lots of pictures of Dance Guard Ershka events by now, but maybe wouldn't have seen Dance Guard and Ershka, so I put up a different picture. <laughs> so what we uh, tried to do was to look at what are the key features of Dance Guard Ershka events, and I think the first obvious one which tends not to be emphasized by most of the explanations is the incredibly rapid warming at the beginning of Dance Guard Ershka events. Uh, okay, there should be, there it, there it is. The incredibly rapid warming at the beginning rather than the cooling, which is what we generally seem to be trying to explain. So that's the first thing. The second one is that cycles repeat without an obvious external trigger. I mean, okay, there are some people who think there may have been something coming from outer space that triggered one or two of them, but not all 23 of them. So we need something that repeats without an obvious trigger. It's got to be self-sustaining. The pattern of climate change that we see obeys the bipolar seesaw equations to a surprising degree. That seems to suggest the involvement of changes in AMOC, although I appreciate there may be other ways to get that kind of a pattern. And that really comes particularly from Steve Barker's paper showing how well you can reproduce Greenland climate just by differentiating Antarctic climate. Then there's the fact that there are no DO events of any magnitude in either interglacials or the coldest periods, and the fact that the Heinrich events, as we've heard several times now, occur during the stadial, stadials, not at the cooling jump. So that's at least the, here's the, this mouse is hard to find. There's the thing that shows that there are only very small and, and brief events during um, marine isotope stage four and two. So what's going on? There are, there are lots of models. I think we're going to hear lots of them today. Nearly, but not quite all of them, invoke changes in the AMOC in some way, which at least explains the spatial pattern of change. But I agree that there are other mechanisms that don't, which I know we're going to hear about. If it's an AMOC change, it is often caused by some kind of a stomal-type hysteresis with multiple equilibria. Generally, it requires freshwater forcing, although often there's no particular explanation for why that should recur over and over again in the way it does. And we, uh, at the time when we were working on this, we were very struck by the Condren and Windsor paper that uses much higher resolution oceanographic models than are generally used and suggested that only if you route water through the Arctic do you really succeed in weakening AMOC, not, it, not just by putting it across the North Atlantic in the way that traditional hosing experiments do. So what we did was a bunch of glaciologists, a paleoclimatologist, that's me, an oceanographer who I've forgotten to put uh, up there, and mathematicians got in a room and tried to find the simplest plausible physical mechanism that matches the things that we felt were really important. And we started off in this case by assuming that AMOC changes explain the global pattern of change, and so what we're trying to do is to explain self-sustaining oscillations of the AMOC. And this is a use of a model. I don't think one should forget what models are for. This is not a model to predict what happened. This is the use of a model to suggest an idea, and then it's up to us to find paleo data or more realistic modeling to challenge that idea. So a verbal description of what the model is. You've got strong AMOC, which causes high pole wood heat transport and warms the mid-latitude ice sheets, and that'll lead to more runoff from the ice sheets. So this is a traditional uh, kind of idea. That would in itself take the system to the weak branch of the AMOC because the runoff is fresh water. The cooling then reduces the runoff and starves the ocean of fresh water, which takes you back to the strong branch. So that's fine, but that would give you a, a, a very quick oscillator. That would just keep oscillating backwards and forwards very fast. So the, the key extra feature is that if you put the runoff into the Arctic Ocean, then you buffer the runoff by changes in Arctic Ocean salinity, which then affects the fresh water entering the critical parts of the Atlantic. You impose a time scale, essentially. So here's a very simple cartoon of the model. You've got the Atlantic, two boxes, the Atlantic and the Arctic. You've got salinity in each. You've got runoff from the ice sheet into the Arctic, and you've got runoff directly into the Atlantic. And you've got fresh water passing between the Arctic and the Atlantic. Well, you've actually got, of course, an exchange of water in both directions, but it's a net fresh water effect going this way. So then we need some equations. Don't worry too much about them, because I don't understand all of them either. So, <laughs> firstly, we've got the equation for the hysteresis of the AMOC. That's just a simple cubic is the, is the function there, but it could be a number of things. 
We've got an equation for the Arctic runoff, and in this case what we're doing is assuming that the runoff is controlled by temperature, which in, in turn is controlled by the AMOP strength. Now, I'm very aware, and I certainly agree, that changes in sea ice, are, particularly winter sea ice, are a very important part of what goes on at Danskod Ershka events. In this particular case, what we've done is to assume that amplification through these sea ice changes is all rolled into this factor lambda. So this lambda is a, is a huge sausage with all kinds of things inside it. Then we need an equation for conserving salt in the Arctic Ocean, uh, which is just here, and that, that includes X, which is this exchange parameter between the Arctic and the, and the North Atlantic. And then we can derive from that the freshwater flux from the Arctic to the North Atlantic here. That's uh, derived from everything else. So I'll just run you through the way this then works. So we've got our ocean equilibrium line here. This is this cubic, I said, the traditional Stommel-type instability. Then we've got the line that looks at the salinity against, or rather salinity equilibrium line, which is essentially the slope of lambda, that runoff parameter here. Then we've got, maybe you can't even see them because it's hard to see them from this angle, but we've got some lines of constant salinity here on this, on this plot of Q against freshwater forcing. And if you get a rapid change, in other words, if you, if you have to move rapidly, you've got to move along a line of constant salinity. It's the Arctic salinity, I should say. Okay, so now what, so, so what we're having here is some cycles where you start at point B with a warm AMOC. That means you've got a lot of runoff, so the salinity of the Arctic is decreasing along this line until eventually it can't go any further, so it has to zoom down the line of constant salinity to here, to the cold stage. The AMOC is now weak, it's cold, so there's not much runoff. So now the salinity in the Arctic is increasing again because it's being starved of fresh water. And then you get to point A and the same thing keeps cycling again. Whether cycles occur at all, in other words, whether the intersection of this black line and the blue line, which is where everything is um, in steady state, whether cycles occur at all depends on the shape of this blue curve and the gradient of this black line and I'll show you something about that in a minute. So if you run this model, very simple as you can see, only four equations essentially, with a parameter set that we consider reasonable having consulted the glaciologists and the oceanographer in the room, then you do get uh, oscillations of everything that you expect to be oscillating, including the temperature on roughly 1,000 year time scales, so that's about right, that's fine. But then, of course, Danskar Oshka events do not occur on regular timescales. They don't occur every thousand years. They have a variable periodicity. So there are ways to rationalize that. The periodicity can vary if either the exchange flux between the Arctic and the Atlantic varies or if the runoff sensitivity changes. And in particular, you can get periods when there are no, um, when there are no oscillations at all. For instance, if there's no ice, as in an interglacial, then that lambda, the sensitivity of runoff to temperature, is very small, which means that this black line is very steep. And as you can see, if the black line is very steep, what happens is that it passes through this curve in two places, both of which are stable. They're no longer unstable. They're places where the system tends to move back to the red dot, as opposed to here, where it tries to move away from the red dot. So you could have a stable warm or a cold state in this case, or the black line could be displaced in, whoops, and you just have, thank you, and you just have uh, either a warm or a cold stable state. Another way to stop the oscillation would be if the ice sheet was so large, as for example in the LGM, that the runoff no longer routed north, but instead went into the Atlantic, and then the sensitivity of runoff to the Arctic would again be very low. Uh, but that's, uh, again, just a rationalization of what might have happened. So what's the role of Heinrich events in all this? Well, they have no direct role at all in this mechanism. I guess I thought that would come as a bit of a shock to people, but since all three of the first talks seem to say that Heinrich events don't have much to do with dansk Ershka events, I guess I'm just adding to a, uh, an open goal, kicking into an open goal. But what Heinrich events would do is provide an increase in what we called RN, that's the flux directly into the, uh, into the Atlantic, which would negate the freshwater starvation that would occur in our mechanism during the cold stage. So it would prolong the cold stage, and indeed stadials containing H events do tend to be long, 
but it doesn't really have anything to do with the mechanism at all. And in fact, I rather suspect that Heinrich events have been a, red he a gigantic red herring that have delayed us understanding Danske-Oroska events for several years. So the conclusion is that we present a possible mechanism for self-sustaining Danske-Oroska events. It would be a natural oscillation arising from temperature control changes in runoff from ice sheets buffered through the Arctic. It particularly emphasizes the freshwater starvation leading to the rapid warming, um, although obviously it covers both sides of the, of the um, warming and the cooling. Unlike most mechanisms, it doesn't require pulses of fresh water, which actually makes the evidence for it much harder to look for, I have to say, but it doesn't require pulses of fresh water, which is probably quite helpful since we don't seem to find all these pulses of fresh water. Uh, the variable frequency and lack of events in interglacials and very cold periods can be rationalized as the peripheral role of H events. And clearly this is a model that's up there to be knocked down. More complex modeling, improved constraints on the parameters, and evidence relating to its predictions that particularly relate to the salinity of the Arctic are clearly needed to test whether this has any importance at all. But uh, we, me and my co-authors, throw it on the table for you to give a good kicking to. Thank you. <laughs>